Gemara speaks about the Shem and Hamishka, the oil that was used in the Mishkan and the Beis Hamikdash, to anoint the Kohen Gadol and to anoint kings when they when they attain their position. And the Gemara says that the place to do the anointing was by a magnum, by a spring. And everybody learns Pashup Shat that the Gemara means to say, because a Mayan, a spring, is always flowing, and we're giving them a blessing that their kahuna and their kingdom should also continue for many years. But I saw another beautiful shot. The difference between a Mayan and other bodies of water is that other bodies of water dry up, freeze, etc. They fall prey to the different weather patterns. A mayon stays constant. I've been at the OU for 25 years and I've been working together with the COR for 25 years. And one of the things that is most unique about being involved in Kashrus is that the food industry and food technology is changing every day, literally. What we thought was always kosher is now always treif. What we thought was always treif is now always kosher. In our industry, we find very little constant. We find very little steady. The one, one of the islands of constant dedication and constant vigilance to the highest standards of kashrus are our colleagues at the COR. And therefore, even though it's Arab Pesach and it's a busy time, for all of us, including myself, when Rabbi Adler called us to try to come, we felt we couldn't say no to Rabbi Adler and to our friends at the COR, because they deserve it. And I'm sure the members of this community who have much closer connection and benefit from the COR much more than we do in New York, owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude. And they should talk of be like a mayon. They should constantly flow and be stronger in all situations for the avoid of Hashem. Everybody's preparing for the Seder. It's interesting. It used to be that I'm not an anthropologist. But an anthropologist said, I'm sure Canada is no different than the United States, that the holiday that's mo that was always most observed in the Jewish community was Yom Kippur. 90% of Jews attended shul or did something on Yom Kippur. And surveys have shown that that has completely changed. And 90% of Jews have a Seder, but they don't necessarily attend shul on Yom Kippur. It's probably because it's easier to eat than to fix. <laughs> But if, if Seder, if the pace of Seder is such an important part of our religious experience and it's such an important mitzvah, then there's an obvious question. We make a brach on every mitzvah that we do, but there's no bracha that's made at the beginning of the Seder. Asher Kishon of the Mitzvah of the Kodesh Baruch commanded us on this night, the Pesach, to fulfill the mitzvah of Sipu Yitzhiz Mitzrayim speaking about our going out of Mitzrayim. Such a wonderful, important, once a year mitzvah, and no bracha. Megillah, Rosh Hashanah, every time, Hanukkah, we make a bracha. Where's the bracha on Sipi Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim? Furthermore, this is one of the only mitzvahs, if not the only mitzvah that I can recollect, that the halacha keeps on repeating and keeps on repeating, kol if you do more and more, if you speak more about Sipi Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, Harez and Meshubach is great. And there's a fascinating Rambam. The Rambam says that not only are you supposed to be marvelous Sipi Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, speak a lot about Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, but the Rambam says, we know that by the Seder we're supposed to sit in a leaning fashion. And the Rambam says not only are you supposed to sit when you drink the Dao Kaisa, when you drink the Four Cups, when you eat the Matzah, but if you could lean all night, Harez and Meshubach, that's great. Why? Let's, why is that so important to the Rambam? <coughs> In these parashas that we're reading, the Shabbosim, 
as we get ready for Pesach, we're reading the Parshish Kabbalists. The different Kabbalists that we have to bring for different occasions, again, those of us who are learning the Yomi, we're learning to say the Kachim, we're learning the Mesechus about Kabbalists. And one of the Kabbalists that had to be brought was a carbon Taita. A carbon Taita means that somebody who experienced he wasn't well, he was in jail, Shalom, and he Baruch Hashem well. He brings a carbon title, a carbon of thanksgiving. And there's a fascinating rush. The rush says that the Seder is for the carbon title. And when a carbon title was brought, 40 loaves were brought with them, 30 with three types of matzah, and one was chametz. And the three matzahs that we have at the Seder, in the Kara, correspond to the three matzahs of the carbon title. And the fourth matzah, which is chametz, will be the Shtei Alechem on Shuz. Fascinating words that the Rosh is saying. He's saying that the Seder is a carbon title. But there's a fantastic Rashi in this week's parasha. Rashi says that even if someone experienced an event for which he has to bring a carbon title, he just doesn't bring it because he's obligated to bring it. He only brings it because he wants to bring it. He has that feeling in his heart, and if he has that feeling in his heart, he shows it by bringing a carbon title. You don't bring it just because you meant you have to bring it. And that's what the Seder is all about. The Seder is a time where we're not sitting by the Seder because we have to sit by the Seder. We're not sitting by the Seder because that's what's being Jewish. We sit by the Seder because it's an opportunity for us to express our appreciation to Hashem that He took us out of the triumph and to Hashem for what He does for us every day, all the time. So if we're going to make a bracha, Asher Krishan Vitzivanu, we were commanded, then we missed the point. If you're coming to the Seder and you feel by the Seder that you were forced to sit by the Seder, then you miss the point of the Seder. I told my Vassar, I have the opportunity that I'm on the radio the last couple of weeks every night in New York with questions and answers about Pesach. And this is already going on for a couple of years. I was even interviewed, they, they didn't want to miss a day, I was interviewed in my hotel room this evening before I came here, but I find that it used to be that the questions I got were primarily halakhic questions. Now there are a lot of hashkafa type of questions. So somebody called on the radio last week with a very interesting question. I thought it was my wife actually. She, she, the question was as follows. The husband, the father, wants to have a very long sailor. And the wife is tired. She wants to go to sleep. And so what are we to do? Tough question. I guess my least was a shul rub. He, he could deal with this type of question. Listen to the wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's sitting on this side of the table. Answer the all questions. So, so I actually said similar. I, I was maybe a little more. I was a little more diplomatic. What I said is that halach is that I should have to fan a shino. You have to speak about sipi yitzis the You have to speak about the hagada until you fall asleep. But it doesn't say you have to do it during the Seder. So finish the Seder, let your wife go to sleep, and you can be up all night. And I actually heard that from my father when I was a little boy, and I used to sit by the Seder, and I wanted to say the Torah. My father said, I have a good idea. Let's finish the Seder, and you say the Torah then. <laughs> so the, you, you, you can't come to a Seder feeling that you have to say, that, you, that you're abrogated. You have to come to the Seder that you want to be part of it. If you're going to say that Sivanu, I was commanded, then it's not a carbon tiger, then you missed the point. You have to sit with a Seder, the entire Seder, says the rabbi, because somebody who really feels that this is something that has to do with me, this is my own Suda Seder, this is my own festive meal for what's happened to me. And perhaps that's why Pesach is the Yontif that's so involved with the food that we eat. Because First of all, we're preparing a festive meal. It's a meal that we're preparing for the young tif, that we appreciate for what Hashem does. And it also shows that every part of our lives, there's probably nothing that's more gashmius 
the food, but it all is part of our service of Hashem. And that's why Baruch Hashem, as we approach Pesach, we think about food in a very serious way, and we think about the cashless of the food in a very serious way. There are obviously many subjects to speak about when we speak about cashless in general and cashless all year round. I'm just going to touch on a, on a number of subjects, not many, and if there'll be any questions about subjects that people have, I'll be happy to try to answer. One issue, which is obviously related to Pesach, but it isn't spe Pesach specific, and that is people call all of the time, and they say, there's a food that's kosher, and why should it be kosher for Pesach? I looked at the ingredient panel, and there's nothing on the ingredient panel that seems to make it a problem for Pesach. And I know it's kosher, because I have a good ashbox, I have the COR, so why can't I just assume that it's kosher for Pesach? And frankly, the same question comes up, not just on Pesach, it comes up all year round. You know, we, we are intelligent people, we understand an ingredient panel, and we think that by looking at an ingredient panel, that's enough to tell us that something is kosher. And I have to respectfully tell you that if somebody has their kitchen based on that approach, they should probably cash in the kitchen. And I'll give you some examples of why. When I came to the OU 25 years ago, we certified seven factories in China. Today we certified 450 factories in China. And we're not the only Hasbrocha that certifies factories in China. What we are now, all of us read in the paper all the time about the different issues that come up in China, which are health related issues. And they're serious issues. But that is only telling of the difference of culture and the difference of production between the way things are done here and the way things are done, I say here I mean in North America, versus the way things are done in the Far East. You know, factories that are built under a communist regime are built with a very different mentality than factories that are built in our economic system. A factory that's baking bread and cookies, I'm supposed to speak about that in Pesach, but a factory that's baking bread and cookies is not typically going to be canning meat in the United States, in Canada. In China, their, their attitude was, we're going to build these huge factories that could do everything in one factory. And the same factory that's making something that's so innocuous is also making something that is as straight as can be on the same equipment. Factories <coughs> that are using ingredients that we assume are always kosher in the United States are using different sources for the very same ingredients because those are the materials that are available in those countries, not available here. So I'll give you a great example, Era Pesach type of an example. Here in North America, there's an abundance of corn. There's an abundance of corn. And therefore, mo mo most sweeteners are to one degree or another corn-based. In China, there isn't that kind of availability of corn. And they're going to use different sources. Of course, there's a cultural difference when you come to, an, you come to a country that doesn't know what a Jew is, doesn't know what a rabbi means, and doesn't even know what religion means. Because they're so, totally atheist environment. And you're trying to explain to them about concepts that they're totally foreign to. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that there isn't a product that you have at home besides maybe a plain piece of meat, a raw piece of meat, that doesn't have an ingredient that started in China. Every product that you have at home has ingredients that come from China. So now, are you going to rely on the ingredient panel? And that's why 
I have to urge, and the fact that you've come tonight as a proof that you care about Kashrus, don't rely on what you read on a panel. It's not only for Pesach, it's for all year round. And we heard from Rabbi Kravkin, the Baruch and you in Toronto are fortunate enough to have Rabbonim who are available to answer your shyness. Take advantage. Don't assume anything. Another issue that comes up very often as we prepare for Pesach, again, it's not a specific Pesach issue, but it's an issue that people aren't aware of necessarily. And that's the issue of chocolate. For some reason, people, everybody eats chocolate on Pesach. And the issue is power of chocolate. A very, very complicated issue. <clears throat> because essentially, I'm not aware of a chocolate factory anywhere in the world that doesn't mo both make power of chocolate, bittersweet chocolate, and dairy chocolate. So you would assume, like many of you have done or will be doing over the next couple of days, you're going to be cashing different utensils that you have at home. And all of us know that the simplest form of cashering is what's known as hagolo, which means boiling out. So if you have a pot that you used or a silverware that you used for nagosher, you boil them out. I guess the fancy word is sterilization. So, a chocolate factory that's making dairy chocolate, so how are you gonna make powdered chocolate? No problem. We'll run, we'll run water through the machinery and then we'll be able to make powdered chocolate. The worst thing you can bring into a chocolate factory is water. They don't let water into the factory. Bring anything in, but don't bring water. And all of you know about it. You know how you all know about it? Because if you, if you, do you ever notice, that, I don't know if ever gets that happening in Toronto, but if, do you ever notice in the summer when it gets humid, the chocolate gets discolored? Because if chocolate comes in contact with any moisture, it gets ruined. So the one thing that they don't allow into a chocolate factory is water. So now it's not so simple anymore. You have your dairy chocolate, you have your milk of your chocolate, and you want to run powdered chocolate, but you can't cash the equipment because you can't run water through it. So some hash buckets run through liquid cocoa butter. They liquefy cocoa butter and they run it through the equipment. And that's a difficult halachic shaiva because preferentially with hachila, once you're not cash only with water. And therefore, cocoa butter is certainly not water. And therefore, when it comes to power of chocolate, it's a real challenge for Hasbachas. For years, we at the OU did not have any certified power of chocolate available. Now we do have some Swiss power of chocolate, because what they're doing, they're still not letting the water into the factory. But what we do is a different type of capturing, leave them with a torch. That's fine, as long as you don't burn down the factory. <laughs> another issue, another issue that comes up before Pesach, and again, I think it's, it's a testimony to, to the Jewish community when we speak about the, this, this issue. Of course, one of the most important foods that we buy for Pesach is wine. We all have to have the double kaisa, we all have to have the four cups of wine, better say it. And the days where everybody bought the simple Concord wine, a long over. And we at the OU ourselves certify wine all around the world. All around the world, actually as we're speaking, you know, if anybody knows anything about wine production, wine production is in September. The end of the summer, the beginning of the fall, is when the grapes ripen, and that's when you make wine. But there's another hemisphere in the world, and that hemisphere of the world now is the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall. Australia, South America. So as we're speaking, we have Mashgich in, in Australia producing kosher wine, because now it's the wine season in Australia. And we have wine in Australia, and we have wine from South America, from South Africa, and from all around the United States. Very wide variety of wines. But there are a lot of difficult shyness when we speak about wine that I just want to sensitize the audience to. Firstly, something that's come to our attention and is a very important issue. There is a lot of Israeli wine in the market. 
and certainly there's a lot of very fine Israeli wine in the market, and there's certainly a strong point to try to buy that wine that helps our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael. There's a lot of 2008 wine available in the market. 2008 was a Shemitah year in Israel. You can't certify wine that's produced in the Shemitah year. And since people in Israel are much more sensitive, much more sensitive to wine, to Shemitah, and to Truma, and to Maisa than we are, because we live in Chutz Laaretz. So what many of these wine manufacturers have done is they're sending this wine to, the, to, to America. And they're even selling it at a very good price. And people have, kept, have approached us and told us, you know, bottles of wine that normally cost $100, I was able to get them at seal. And I got it for $50 a bottle. And they said, check what year it was made. They said it was made 2008. 2008 was a Shemitah year, it's no Metzia at all. You can't do anything with that wine. So, in general, particularly when you buy wine from Israel, you have to be always very careful when you're buying wine to make sure that it has a proper Hashgacha. You have to be particularly careful that it's not a Shemitah year. There are issues of Truma and Meister. There are issues of Orla. We're not allowed to use grapes during the first four years of their growing in Israel. Most fruits and vegetables aren't usable in the first four years. But they are grapes you could squeeze even when they're very small. And there's a real all the issues. Many, many of the wineries in Israel, many, many of the wineries in Israel do not pasteurize the wine. And therefore you have an issue of wine that's not reversal. Many people have guests at their home on Pesach who are not religious. Many people have help at home which are, who are not Jewish. And when you have non-reversal wine, if they touch that wine or they pour that wine, you have a real serious issue. I can also tell you, as an aside, because of this issue, if you travel El Al to or from Israel, the wine that's served, and this is not relevant to me, on the OU budget, but tell them the name. If you travel first class or business class, the wine that you're being served is not Mavushal. What we were able to accomplish with Al Al, but you have to know to ask for it, is that if you ask them, they'll give you the whole bottle closed. But if the students pours the wine for you, for you, you have a real issue, because most of the students are not religious Jews. There's a real issue of non reversal wine coming out of Israel and coming out of France. Most of the wine from Israel and France, the fine wine, are not reversal. There are many other issues involved in the production of wine in terms of mashgichim and who the mashgichim are, in terms of cashing the, the plant. And again, I urge you strongly Yes, Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of good wine available, but be careful to use wine only with a very acceptable Ashgacha. <coughs> One more point, which I'm sure you're all waiting to hear on my leaf, um, is the issue of medicine. Again, probably one of the most interesting and common questions that we get is regarding medicine <coughs> for Pesach. And just to tell you, and this is not just the OU policy, but we've had the opportunity to discuss this issue amongst many Rabbonin throughout the country, and this is the policy, and I think it would be helpful as a guide as we get ready for Yom Kippur. The first, first, first thing that I must say is if you're taking a medicine because you have a serious medical condition, don't ask the child. Don't ask a child. Just take the medicine. It's between knafesh. Take the medicine, and there's no child. But not everybody, bar Hashem, is that ill. Hopefully, no one should be that ill. And what is the policy in medicine? Well, the truth is, most medicines are certainly not kosher. Most medicines have in them. Many medicines have in them glycerin. Many medicines have in them stearates. These are ingredients that are very, very kosher sensitive, 
And if the medicine doesn't have a shkocha, you could say, you could assume that the source of the ingredient is not kosher. In other words, glycerin and stearates are all essentially fats that are broken or transformed into di in different types of results. And animal fat is a lot cheaper and a lot more available than vegetable fat. So if a company is not obligated to buy a glycerin or a stearate with a hashgacha because they're not certified, your assumption should be that it's not kosher. So if it's not kosher, how am I telling you to take the medicine? Because what happens with the medicine is the medicine is not edible. And even on Pesach, when we know that even the smallest amount of chametz is an issue, given that it's not edible, and even though you're taking it as a medicine, the Chazanish says, that doesn't mean that you're considering their food. It doesn't mean that you really want to eat it. You're taking it because you have to. And therefore, any medicine that is a pill, a pill that's swallowed, not chewed, can be taken on Pesach. If it is a medicine value to it. If there's not a medical value to it, and you're just taking it because somebody told you it's a good idea to take it, that perhaps you should avoid during Pesach. Otherwise, you could take it. Liquids and chewable tablets are entirely, entirely different because they're actually eaten or swallowed when it's a liquid. And those medicines should not be taken unless you know that they're fine. There are various publications that are available that list a lot of these medicines. I do have to tell you, I do have to tell you that many of these publications are not extremely reliable, even though they're made by people who work very hard to prepare them. I'll give you a great example. And it was actually a question that was asked this evening for the radio in New York. In New York, every Pesach store that they have these special Pesach sections has Listerine as acceptable for Pesach. Now, Listerine doesn't have Ashbacha, and there was an assumption that the alcohol that's used in Listerine is corn-based, which is only kidneys. And therefore, it's a mouthwash, not eating it, and a lot of people are lenient. Well, we just discovered last week that nobody can guarantee that it's a corn-based alcohol. Because what happened in the United States was that the price of corn, of ethanol, I don't know if you're familiar with this entire situation with ethanol, but there are much better uses and you can get much more money for your corn than turning it into alcohol. So there isn't that much corn available, and it could be a wheat-based alcohol, which is mamish hummus. So therefore, you need to really be careful with everything that you buy. Is it really certified? The fact that it appears in a store doesn't mean that it's kosher for Pesach. The fact that there's an assumption that it's kosher for Pesach isn't any, is not a safe assumption. You need to do your own research. You need to talk to Rabban. As we, as we approach this yontiv of Pesach, which is so focused on what we eat, I guess because we are what we eat, we, we should recognize that Baruch Hashem, the Hashgachas, work very, very hard on trying to deliver a really kosher product. But I tell everybody, and with this I'll, I'll end, that the real Rabbanim HaMachshirim, the real Rabbanim HaMachshirim are not the Rabbanim. The real Rabbanim HaMachshirim are the customers. And I'll tell you a great story. For many, many years, many, many years, the OU was talking to Mars about getting their chocolate products certified. Again, it's called Stam, for those of you who eat called Stam, but and they were never interested, never interested. They finally came to the OU for certification, not because they got interested, but there are many ice creams that we certify that have little pieces of M&Ms. And the ice cream companies are always certified, and the ice cream companies told Mars, you need to be certified because otherwise you're putting our supervision into jeopardy. So they became certified. Not many months later, not many months later, the Mars company came up to our office. 
and they said to us, we want everything kosher. We want everything only certified. It was incredible. This was a company that never wanted to talk to us. You know, and I'm a New Yorker, so a little spot. Ask them, what happened all of a sudden that, that, that you want, you love us? What happened? All these years you didn't want to talk to us. So they said to us, you know, on the back of every product that we sell, there's an 800 number for consumer questions and comments. And we take those comments and questions very seriously. And after the M&Ms became kosher, we got a lot of calls. And they used a very interesting word. They said, and those calls were passionate, thanking us for making the product kosher. <laughs> and we take those calls seriously. And that's why we decided that we want everything to be already certified. So it wasn't the Rabona. We failed. We couldn't get them interested. You succeeded. You got them interested. So Bar Hashem, there is a lot of kosher food available, but it's in your power to make more food kosher, to help us raise the standards of the kashras by really taking this seriously. Thank you.